but welcome everyone. It's so wonderful uh, for you all to join us uh, tonight. We have a big crowd and, and we're so excited for this series. Uh, series is entitled Precision Wellness in the time of COVID-19. And, uh, and I'd like to first personally kind of welcome you to this. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Um, we have a mixed audience here tonight. We have scientists and we have the community and we have press and, and, and like I said, we're, we're, we're so excited. Um, uh, I, I was on a hike uh, this past Saturday and uh, I had several people on the hike with me and people kept asking questions. Well, what about this? And, and what about that? And what about this? And, and, and this, this series is really focused on the what abouts. Uh, it's been a, quite a year and uh, it's been a, quite a year of uncertainty and quite a year of what about. So, so we're here really to ask and answer the what abouts. Knowledge is power. And, um, and uh, once you gain the power, then people will be following you going, what about? Um, so what are we going to cover in the series? Well, tonight we, we start out with the origins uh, of the pandemic. Uh, we'll move into transitions towards normalcy. I'll give a talk uh, in two months from now on what actually leads to severe disease and death. Uh, we'll move on from there to uh, personalizing and precision uh, wellness in this time. And then we'll end with psychosocial aspects of, of, of COVID-19. Uh, uh, of, of COVID so it's gonna be a wonderful, wonderful uh, session uh, and a wonderful symposia series. For me, uh, it's just an incredible pleasure tonight uh, to introduce one of my favorites. Uh, and he is a fellow associate director of Bio5. And, and uh, Dr. Warby, uh, in the meetings over the last few years, uh, I'm sorry, last few months, last year, he's been the one that's kept me informed about the whatabouts. Um, Every time I was on a meeting with him, I came out of that meeting and I, I felt like I was 10 times smarter than when I went in. So Dr. Warby has, has really predicted how this came about and where it was going and he's, he's done it all along. So I, I'm just delighted to introduce uh, Michael Warby. Uh, He's a professor and head of the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona. He joined the University of Arizona in 2003. He received his PhD from the Department of Zoology at the University of Oxford in 2001 and was a junior research fellow at St. John's College, University of Oxford. He uses the genomes of viruses to trace the evolution of major communicable diseases to understand their origins, their emergence, and how to control them. He's made seminal discoveries pinpointing where, when, and how HIV originated and spread worldwide. How influenza pandemics like the one in 1918, the Spanish flu emerged and killed millions of people. His work is regularly published in Nature and Science. He gets frequent worldwide press, and especially over the last year. His work has been the focus of several books and documentary films, such as Spillover, Tinderbox, Rise of the Killer Virus. Uh, Dr. Warby is a Rhodes Scholar, a Packard Fellow, a National Science uh, Cavalier Fellow and holds the Lewis Falkert 
Marshall Science Research Professorship at the University of Arizona. Michael, it is just a, a, a wonderful privilege to have you tonight. Uh, uh, we're so uh, honored uh, to have you speak and I'm just so happy that you're at the University of Arizona. Uh, welcome, Dr. Warby. Thanks, right back at you, Ski. Thanks for that nice uh, warm introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, and it's uh, great to be here with everybody uh, gathered around the same virtual table. Uh, let me just share my screen. And let's get right into it. Okay, so um, it's been uh, a little more than a year since this virus kind of landed on our uh, radar and, and we've learned quite a few things uh, in those years and I'm going to hit on uh, some of them. Most, most of what I'll be talking about is work that uh, I've done in, in my lab um, and, uh, and some of it is just background like this, uh, this fact that what, what we think ultimately happened was that a bat virus uh, somehow got into humans. We don't know if it was uh, a, a direct movement of the virus from bats into humans, or if uh, uh, another species was, uh, was caught in between. Uh, but what we do know is if you go into nature and you look, especially in these uh, bats called horseshoe bats, they harbor a lot of viruses that look like uh, this, the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Uh, and uh, after the, the previous SARS outbreak uh, at the beginning uh, of, uh, of the century, uh, uh, researchers went in and looked and found that 20 to 30% uh, of this kind of bat had antibodies to SARS-CoV, um, so this original SARS virus. And so in a way, uh, it's not a surprise that this virus jumped. We, we knew it had the capacity to do it. Uh, and sure enough, it did it again. Uh, and so a little bit of background on what was originally called uh, 2019 NCOV and is now called SARS-CoV-2, SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, so at the end of December, a bunch of pneumonia uh, cases were reported in Wuhan many of them linked to this Huanan uh, seafood market. And as soon as that link was made, this market was closed. Uh, and very quickly, uh, really impressively quickly, we went from a mysterious pneumonia to a virus. Uh, so uh, by January 10th, the virus had been isolated uh, and the complete genome of the sequence, uh, genome sequence of the virus was published. Um, in, uh, by, by a couple of uh, colleagues of mine from Oxford, uh, along with Chinese colleagues. Uh, by January 23rd, uh, as you know, uh, the, the government in Beijing really just shut down Wuhan and, and created a cordon sanitaire, uh, first around Wuhan and then around uh, Hubei province, uh, really the most aggressive quarantine in, in human history. Uh, by January 31st, WHO declared it an outbreak of uh, glo uh, the outbreak of global health emergency, but it was clear uh, long before then uh, that this was not only an emergency, but was almost certainly going to result in another pandemic. Uh, so here's an artist's uh, rendering of, of what the virus looks like. And again, this is called a coronavirus. Corona means crown. Uh, and if you look at this virus under a microscope, these little bumps on the outside surface of, of the virus are called the spike protein. Uh, and uh, it looks a lot like you're looking uh, down on a crown. Uh, and this spike protein is really, really important uh, for both the virus and for us. Uh, for the virus, uh, the spike protein is, it's, uh, 
key to get into our human cells. So this big green blob in the background is a human, human cell, gives you an idea of how small viruses are. Uh, and the little hand-like things protruding from the cell uh, are the receptor that the virus uses to get inside the cell. Uh, and this receptor is called uh, ACE2. Uh, and, and all you really need to know is that the spike protein of the virus is kind of like uh, the, the hooks on Velcro and the ACE2 receptor is kind of like the fuzzy part of Velcro. When they stick together, uh, that allows the virus to be engulfed inside of the cell. Uh, once inside, like all viruses, uh, it takes a few genes that it has in its genome. Uh, and with that uh, very small complement of genes, it completely hijacks our cellular machinery, tells the cell, stop doing everything that you were doing uh, and just start making more copies of me. Uh, and so this spike protein uh, is it's important for us, not only on the downside, uh, because it, it uh, allows us to become ill, uh, but on the upside, this is the target of antibodies. So if you're naturally infected, or if you are, are one of the people who's lucky enough uh, to have had the vaccine, what's happening is your body is essentially making some custom drugs ca called antibodies uh, and they stick also like Velcro to the spike protein. Uh, and what will happen is if an antibody is stuck to the, just the right part of the spike protein, it will physically interfere with the sp uh, spike protein's interaction with the cellular receptor uh, and block it from uh, adhering to the surface of the cell, uh, gaining entry and, and hijacking the cell. Here's a little uh, schematic of the, the genome of this virus. Uh, and so I wanna give you uh, just uh, some, some real quick highlights here. At the top, you'll see that this virus has a genome of only about 30,000 nucleotides those nucleotides uh, code for a handful of genes. Uh, every three nucleotides codes for an amino acid and a bunch of amino acids codes for a protein like the spike protein, for example. So here the spike protein is then uh, ballooned out and, and a couple regions of the spike protein are highlighted. Uh, and you can see that uh, these virus, the, the, this human virus is very, very similar to viruses that exist in nature. Uh, in particular, this bat RATG13, uh, that virus in a bat, which was sampled before the COVID outbreak, uh, is 96% uh, identical across that whole genome to SARS-CoV-2. And again, that's why we are sure that this virus ultimately comes from bats. Um, there are uh, interesting patterns. So for example, uh, this pangolin sequence has some really important similarities to uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, pangolin is a, a, a sort of scaly mammal that looks kind of like an anteater. Uh, and pangolins from Malaysia were found to have high similarity to the human virus, SARS-CoV-2, in the region of the spike protein that is really the hook of the Velcro. Um, now, early on, there was a lot of speculation that, okay, there's, there's such similarity that this virus must have come bat to pangolin, pangolin to human. Uh, that's not really pinned down. Uh, it's, it's possible that this virus moved directly from a bat, uh, and it's possible that an, another species was the intermediary. So, for example, cats. Uh, cats have an ACE2 receptor that is very, very similar to the human receptor. Uh, and so uh, this is just pure speculation, but it's possible that cats were the intermediary. Um, okay, so with that behind us, I want you to um, think back to January of 2020 um, 
January of 2021, we had uh, some days 300,000 people being diagnosed with this virus each day. Back in 2020, in, in late January, uh, January 21st, uh, we finally had our first COVID case uh, on US soil. Uh, and this was, uh, this was big news, obviously, because it meant that the virus had, had moved from China to the US. Uh, but it was also really a, an interesting story because it, was, it, it seemed like a really uh, uh, nice story of successful collaboration between someone with this virus and the public health authorities whose job it is to try to prevent that one patient from becoming 300,000 patients a day. Um, and so a tremendous amount of work was done uh, to trace the contacts uh, of, of the uh, person who was infected. This guy was a Chinese national who lived in, just north of Seattle. He'd gone to Wuhan to visit his parents and he was very keyed in to CDC messaging about the new pneumonial disease that was circulating in Wuhan. He got back to SeaTac Airport uh, in, uh, near, near Seattle, January 15th. And by January 19th, started feeling kind of poorly went to the doctor uh, and, and the doctor sent samples to the CDC. Those samples revealed, yes, this per person is uh, infected. And also they were able to take those samples and sequence the complete 30,000 uh, nucleotides uh, of the genome. Uh, and, and that became the very first genome that was sequenced in the US. Uh, Similarly, in uh, Germany, around the same time, sort of getting toward the end of uh, January, uh, you had the first case uh, of the virus. This was a, a, a woman who had traveled from China to Germany uh, and had passed the virus on to several colleagues who worked uh, at a, a, a car parts factory. Okay, so <clears throat> that's January. Then there was this uh, six week period where we were kind of flying blind and we really didn't know if the virus was taking hold and actually causing a local outbreak uh, uh, in different parts of, uh, of the country, or if we were kind of catching all of the people who were bringing the virus in by screening people who had links, uh, travel links to China, or links to someone who did have uh, either the virus or a travel link to China. Uh, and uh, colleagues of mine up in Seattle had a very nice study that they had put together for influenza where they were tracking people with respiratory disease, getting them to self swab their nose. Uh, and then th the plan was to look in those samples later for uh, evidence of influenza or other respiratory infections. So they were kind of sitting on a gold mine because they had all of these samples in, from January and February from people in the Seattle area uh, who had had respiratory infections, just the kind of people you would want to look for the virus in. The problem was the FDA uh, essentially told them to cease and desist that they, that they were not authorized to look for SARS-CoV-2 in those samples. Uh, and so they didn't for uh, uh, several weeks. Uh, and finally, they just kind of threw their hands up in the air and said, screw it, we're gonna look. Uh, and the, the first, uh, one, the, the, the first uh, positive sample that they looked at in that study was from a high school student with no travel links to China whatsoever. Uh, no uh, links to anyone who had been infected. And so a clear uh, indication that community transmission was going on. But what was even more kind of uh, stunning uh, about this was when the scientists looked at those genomes. Uh, and, and so the, the first uh, genome from the patient who arrived from Wuhan on January 15th was called WA1 for Washington State patient number one. 
the second was called WA2. Uh, and then from uh, that point on, uh, they, they gathered more and more genomes from late February. Uh, and what they found when they compared the, the genomes from late February to the genome of WA1 was, lo and behold, they were almost identical. Uh, out of those 30,000 nucleotides, there were really only two key differences uh, uh, that, that separated the, the February samples from the January sample. And again, the thinking with the January sample, WA1, was that it had been successfully um, uh, sort of blocked from being transmitted to anyone else. But the, these scientists concluded uh, the, the most likely scenario, given the similarity between the viruses in February and the earlier one in January, was in fact that, that somehow, despite all of the heroic efforts, that patient WA1 had passed the virus on to at least one other person who had passed the virus on to the next person and so on and so forth. And so not only was there community transmission, but the inference was, holy smokes, we're already six weeks into this thing. Uh, and there might be thousands of people in the Washington area who uh, in Washington state who are already infected with this virus. So it was, it was a key moment, not just in Washington state, but it was really the wake up call to the whole nation that we, we perhaps have not been able to limit the emergence of this virus by screening people with links to China. Similar story in Europe. Uh, again, there's this early outbreak in Germany uh, and it, it infected 16 people, but with very, very aggressive testing, contact tracing, uh, case isolation. Uh, they apparently had ex extinguished this outbreak in, in January and early February. But again, about six weeks later, um, the, the, uh, the, the second uh, sort of European virus was found in Northern Italy. And when it was compared to the virus uh, outbreak from Germany, it was only one nucleotide different. Uh, uh, and that led to uh, speculation that the big outbreak in Northern Italy, which really became the epicenter of the European outbreak, was actually started by cryptic circulation of the, the, the German outbreak that everyone thought had been extinguished. And so I, I was initially pretty convinced, particularly by the WA1 uh, story. The, the evidence seemed pretty strong that it was <clears throat> too much of a coincidence that you'd see such similarity in these viruses if they weren't actually uh, related by descent, if WA1 hadn't actually started the outbreak in North America. Uh, but the more I got a feel for how this virus evolved, um, the more I started to probe that and, and think, you know, it's actually quite possible that it's just a coincidence that these two things were so closely related. And perhaps WA2 and these other February and, uh, and later samples, perhaps they arrived with some other patient who uh, will remain unknown to, to us, uh, but brought the virus in separate from the WA1 patient. Uh, and so to, to sort of cut to the chase, we. Uh, I, I teamed up with uh, a bunch of uh, friends and collaborators from ar around the globe, uh, and including my grad student here, Brendan Larson. Uh, and we went at this a couple of different ways to try to answer this question of, you know, when did the virus really take hold in North America? And, and was it the very first patient? Uh, and part of my motivation here was, if it really was that very first patient, uh, you know, when instead of 300,000 cases a day, we were dealing with one case in the whole country and could put a lot of resources into preventing onward transmission. If we couldn't do it, even when there was one case, it, it seemed a little bit 
hopeless uh, that we would be able to use these tools like contact tracing and case isolation uh, successfully to, to fight this pandemic. So it, it seemed an important question to me. And so, so the way we looked at it was, okay, if you look at the uh, panel D here in the lower right, what we're looking at are a whole bunch of people who are infected, say in week one uh, on the left, and then week two, week three. And so it starts, it always starts with one patient and that patient gives rise to new infections in other patients. Uh, and at the end of the period, you can go out into the population and sample viruses uh, from, from these people. And the color change from yellow to maroon, maroon to blue, that each of the color changes represents a mutation. So in reality, what we saw in Washington state was all of the, the genomes that we see in February uh, and later have these two key mutations separating them from this early January patient, uh, this Chinese national who traveled back from Wuhan. Uh, and so the question is, why do we only see that when we could have seen all sorts of other patterns? We could have seen that WA1 had passed an identical virus to his own virus onto someone else who was sampled. Uh, and that virus had zero mutations differing from WA1. We never see that. We never, we never saw in Washington state another virus that looked exactly like WA1. It was always these two mutations different. And, and then uh, you don't need to worry about the, the details here. Um, but what we decided to do was to rerun the epidemic in our computers over and over and over again, under the assumption that the, the outbreak in Washington state really did start with WA1. Uh, and to do that, you, uh, you take realistic assumptions about how the virus moves from person to person uh, and, and you allow uh, the virus to start uh, in one person and then to spread for several weeks you then sample a bunch of those patients who've been infected at the end of the outbreak or at the end of the period that you're looking at, uh, and you evolve uh, in, in the computer, you evolve their genomes starting with the genome of this WA1 patient. Uh, and then you look at the patterns that you actually see. And so what did we see? Well, in the top left, um, this is the pattern, again, that you, we actually uh, observe in reality, where WA1's genome is here, and it's two mutations different from all of the other genomes that are sequenced in Washington state. In the simulations, if you start the Washington outbreak uh, with WA1's virus, um, and, and with patient WA1 being the person who brought the virus and started the outbreak, uh, you see that pattern uh, never. You always see uh, different things. And in, in the bottom, for example, is a, is a pattern that you see every time you run the simulations. Every time you run the simulations and get these viruses that are two mutations different from WA1, you also get viruses that are share one of those two differences with WA1, but then have accumulated their own independent mutations that differ from the ones that are actually observed. Uh, and so this is a way that we can use uh, these, these highly replicated uh, simulations to rerun the tape of the outbreak uh, and the evolution of the virus over and over again. Uh, and what do they tell us? They tell us that it's very, very unlikely that WA1 actually started this outbreak. Because if he did, we would see not only the ones that are two mutations different, but ones that share only one of those mutations, but have accumulated uh, their own mutations as well. Uh, so in a nutshell, the patterns observed don't fit what would happen if WA1 was, was the 
the sort of patient zero of the Washington state outbreak. Uh, we went, uh, went about this uh, another way as well, where we use evolutionary trees. And so here's an evolutionary tree. And, and here we're taking the information in the genomes themselves um, to create a sort of family tree to show uh, which viruses are closely related. These two are closely related. Uh, and which viruses are more distantly related. So this virus uh, and this virus are more distantly related. But we also folded in information about um, things like the travel history uh, of different patients, um, things like uh, the, the high degree of undersampling uh, in the Wuhan area where we knew in January most cases of the virus were happening in Wuhan, but very few of the genomes that we had available for sequencing were from Wuhan. Uh, and so we, we developed ways to kind of accommodate uh, and, and account for the missing, the information that we, we knew was missing, the kind of known unknowns. Uh, and what we found was, if you look at WA2 here, the second patient uh, that was discovered in late February, uh, and the rest of these Washington state outbreak lineages, uh, they're quite far away in the tree from WA1's virus. A and they're separated by all these colored branches, uh, which are primarily from different parts of China. So in red is Hubei province, which is where Wuhan is. Uh, in, in this green color is Zhejiang. Uh, and what this is telling us is that initially the virus existed in Hubei province. At some point, it jumped from Hubei to Washington state. Uh, and we knew that history for WA1. We already knew that. But this tree also tells us that a separate time, it jumped independently from China into Washington state uh, to cause this outbreak. And so what this means is uh, this patient, we, you know, we, we probably were successful at, at using these tools like contact tracing and case isolation to limit and, and block onward spread of WA1's virus. Uh, and it's important for another reason. Uh, I, I've, I've done a lot of work, as Ski mentioned, on, on the origins of uh, HIV and how it spread around the world. Uh, and you might be familiar with this um, so-called patient zero who, who kind of got blamed for spreading the virus. Uh, and, and part of what we've shown in my lab is that, that uh, he was just one of thousands of people uh, and played no important role for the origin of the virus in North America or its spread from coast to coast or any really anything else that he'd been accused of. Uh, and he was kind of scapegoated uh, and uh, there's, there was obviously a lot of stigmatization uh, of gay people for uh, the origins or, or the, the spread of HIV. And similarly here in the, in the early days of the outbreak, there was a lot of scapegoating uh, and, and blaming uh, of people from China uh, for uh, the, the outbreak itself and in this case, if this, if this case had gone down in history as, yeah, the North American outbreak started with this patient WA1, who we know uh, was, was from China, uh, it's the kind of thing that can feed into that stigmatization. And, and although, you know, in science, the chips fall where they may, it could have worked out uh, that our study actually corroborated that. And that would have been a scientific fact that we needed to deal with. Uh, but the fact that it, it refuted uh, that notion that this guy was the sort of patient zero of uh, the North American outbreak uh, is, is really important. And interestingly, we can use these same evolutionary techniques to place a date on when this second movement of the virus occurred. And it 
it's right around February 1st, this sort of range of dates here. And that is a very interesting time because uh, February 2nd uh, is when the Trump administration's ban on, uh, on travel from China to the US was put into effect. Uh, but it was never really a, a full ban on travel because although Chinese passport holders were barred from traveling, about 40,000 Americans and, and uh, visa holders were allowed to travel after the ban from China to the US. And it's very, very plausible that it's one of those 40,000 people uh, who's not Chinese who actually started this North American outbreak uh, in, in Washington state. Uh, and and, uh, and I, I just think it's, it's very important to, to, to point that out. And also that if, if that is what happened, um, some of the, the blame uh, for this establishment of the outbreak needs to go to the authorities who were screening those 40,000 people because that screening was notoriously lax. Uh, you could hop uh, off, off the plane and move out into the community with, with really just uh, uh, one question, like, do you have a fever, which is not a, a, a good way of screening for this virus. Okay, similarly, uh, in, in this case of, uh, did the Italian outbreak, which became the European outbreak, actually start with the German uh, virus, which is listed here as BAVPAT, Bavarian patient one. Uh, same story here that this is uh, what we observe, uh, but you always expect uh, a different pattern in these simulations, uh, which again suggests that the virus, the, the outbreak in Italy didn't start in Bavaria. And similarly, uh, in this evolutionary tree here, again, red is Hubei province where Wuhan is. So at some point, the virus moves from Hubei uh, to Bavaria and, and causes this outbreak that I mentioned, 16 patients that was apparently successfully extinguished. Uh, and actually uh, for aficionados, it didn't move directly from Hubei. Uh, the, the person who, who moved that virus uh, was from Shanghai, but her parents had visited her from Hubei province. Uh, so that's the German outbreak. And then also from red, so from Hubei province, a separate outbreak gives rise to all these green branches, which represent the Italian uh, outbreak. And then the blue uh, group of genomes here nested within the Italian uh, genomes those are all from New York City. And so what we're seeing here is the virus moving from Hubei separately to Germany and to Italy, uh, going explosive in Italy and across other parts of Europe, and then moving from Europe into uh, North America. And so at the end of the day, Although the virus did move uh, from China to Washington state with this separate introduction around February 1st and started a, a very big outbreak there, it was really this movement of the virus from Hubei to Italy around the beginning of January or the end of January rather. Uh, and then from Italy or some other part of Europe uh, into, onto the east coast of the states that really drove the outbreak. And, and within a couple of months, this European lineage, uh, which turned out to be slightly more transmissible uh, than this Washington uh, outbreak clade, uh, it had replaced the Washington outbreak uh, completely. Uh, and here in Arizona now, almost all of the genomes that are circulating trace back to this Italy to uh, Hubei to Italy, Italy to North America jump of the virus. Uh, although we now have B117, which is this UK variant, uh, which is, um, has arrived in, in the US, including Arizona, 
it's even more transmissible um, than uh, this, this variant here. All right, shifting gears quickly. <clears throat> there have been reports uh, for the, the virus circulating in, for example, Italy as early as September. Uh, so we used this same approach to ask the question about uh, when the actual first case of this virus existed in Hubei province. And there are a variety of options, uh, of, of different alternatives that, that could have uh, described the evolution of this virus in Hubei province. Uh, when we make these evolutionary trees, we, we put a date on what's called the time of the most recent common ancestor. And so this is the big blue circle. So this big blue circle is the most recent common ancestor of all of the genomes that you sample at this time point. Uh, that could have been identical to the time of the very first patient, as it is in this top left panel, but it also could have been much later. The index patient could have given rise to a small number of infections that went, you know, over several days, weeks, or even months, uh, and then uh, gave rise to the common ancestor of the genomes that we sequence. But um, <clears throat> what we see is, is that um, although this, we calculate that the the index patient really did exist before the common ancestor of the genomes that we can sample, it, it's not very far back in time. So there was this kind of fuse before it exploded, but the fuse was pretty short and it's really implausible that this virus was circulating anyway, anywhere uh, further back than about October, 2019. Uh, and so reports of the virus being in Italy in September are just not credible. Um, we also in this study can show that very few people uh, could have been infected in these early time periods. Um, and that means that it's going to be really difficult in future situations like this, where you have a a highly transmissible virus, but asymptomatic uh, spread. People who don't feel ill can spread the virus. Uh, it's gonna be really hard to nip that kind of pandemic in the bud because there's just so few people involved in, in, until it kind of explodes. One, one last thing is uh, one interesting thing that came out of this study is that we found that 70% of outbreaks, if you reran it again and dropped SARS-CoV-2 into the human population into one person, 70% uh, of the time it would go extinct by itself. Unfortunately, uh, we're living in a world where that unlucky 30% prevail. Uh, okay, just to finish off very quickly, uh, I wanna touch on these COVID variants you've heard so much about. Uh, and in a nutshell, what we're looking at are variants that have changes to their spike protein that either make them uh, stickier, like Velcro, and that makes them more highly transmissible, or changes to the spike protein that e uh, sort of uh, escape from the immune response that you might have had from a previous infection or a vaccine. Um, and one of those, for example, is a, a little deletion of six uh, nucleotides in the UK variant in the spike gene, uh, as shown here. That little deletion has been quite useful for tracking the emergence of this uh, UK variant in North America. So this is a, a, a paper that uh, we just put out uh, in a preprint and is uh, in, uh, in review now. Uh, and it shows that, uh, unfortunately, the UK variant is doing the same thing in the US that it's done everywhere else. Uh, this is an evolutionary tree that shows uh, all in white strains of this virus from England and other European countries, um, or, or variants of the virus, I should say. Um, and so nested within all of those European uh, UK variant sequences, 
is, for example, this big group of viruses here from California, CA1. And what that represents, we think, is just a single movement. One person brought uh, this variant uh, of uh, the UK variant and started an outbreak in California. Another person brought uh, the virus to Florida and started, started a big outbreak there. Uh, and so there must have been many, many independent movements of the virus from the UK into California, into, into the US, and some of them have, have gone uh, really explosive like Florida and California. And we can look uh, in some detail at what's happening in those places. This is the proportion of B117 cases. So the proportion out of all the cases, how many, what proportion of them are the UK variant? Uh, and by, the mid, by, by mid December, it was still almost none even though actually we, we date the origins of both the Florida and the um, California outbreak to November. So it was here, but at such low levels that you can barely see it. Uh, but from mid-December up till the end of January, you can see this explosive spread where uh, by the end of January, the virus already was about 5% of cases in Florida. Uh, and we think that it's now well above 10%. And in fact, <clears throat> we can estimate uh, based on uh, the logistic growth rates uh, that the proportion of UK variant cases in Florida is doubling every nine days. And that means by the beginning of March, more than half of cases, <clears throat> excuse me, in Florida will be the UK variant. In California, it's going a bit slower. <clears throat> it's doubling about every 12 days. Uh, and so it's not gonna be as explosive. It'll be April, beginning of April before uh, that variant dominates in California, we think, but it's on its way. Um, and we don't think uh, <clears throat> that there's too much that can be done uh, to prevent this virus from taking hold, eliminating all of its weaker competitors that aren't as highly transmissible. Uh, and this variant also appears to cause uh, a higher proportion of, of people um, to uh, have severe infections and die. All right. so. With that, I just want to uh, thank uh, all of my co-authors for, for all of those studies, but I also just want to uh, especially thank the people who work in my lab. So um, Grace Quirk, Brandon Larson, and Tom Watts. <clears throat> They've done tremendous work, um, uh, in, including lots of work with these viruses without, uh, before they, they had vaccines. So kudos to them. And with that, thanks to you all. And I'll take questions. Well, I, I think you guys uh, can certainly see why Dr. Warby is one of my favorite people. I just sit and listen to him and, and thank you so much for that wonderful talk. I mean, I, I, like I said, I learn something new every time I listen to you. It was a wonderful talk. Got so excited before uh, Dr. Warby's talk, I forgot to, uh, First of all, thank Bio5 for this symposia series. Uh, we thank you all for joining us. We're gonna take some question and answers uh, here in a few minutes. Uh, um, I also uh, was so excited I forgot to introduce myself. Um, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ski Chilton. I'm a professor here. Uh, I'm actually the director of the Precision uh, Nutrition and Wellness uh, Initiative. So, so, so we're so excited you're here. Um, put your questions uh, in the Q&A window. Uh, you, you'll see the Q&A window at the bottom. Uh, we still have a bunch of people on the call. Uh, well, my friend, Dr. Warby, 
You're amazing. Uh, we're so lucky to have you here at the U of A. We're so fortunate to be here in Bio5. I've been many places and I've never seen a place quite like Bio5. Uh, and, and, and you're one of the superstars and we're just so lucky to have you and we were so lucky to hear from you tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I appreciate all the great questions. That's, that's really impressive. Thank you. And just before we leave, uh, um, uh, the next uh, um, session, uh, Precision Wellness in the time of COVID session will be March 15th. Uh, it'll be transition to normalcy. We all wanna know that. Testing and public health measures in the time of vaccines. And then I'll present on uh, 419 and uh, my talk will be why COVID-19 induces severe and lethal diseases in some folks and not others. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we really, really appreciate it. And your questions were outstanding. And uh, I hope you all learned a lot tonight. I know I learned a lot tonight. So uh, have a good evening um, and uh, we'll see you next time.